Well, hello and thank you everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So I'm with Gregor from Callahan Innovation and Gregor is an R&D consultant with a data science background and passion for creating digital art. And he's going to be running us through a two-part presentation, part technical and part non-technical on how he created some NFTs on Cardano. But before we kick off, we'll just do some quick housekeeping. So this session will be recorded and we'll re be re-uploading this into the events recap section in Circle. During Gregor's presentation, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat box and we will circle back around to them at the end. Um, and then also, hopefully, before we go into some questions, we'd up, if you could just give us two minutes of your time a quick survey on our um, learning series. So and I will pass over to Greg Orr to kick off. Cool. Thanks, Kelly. Welcome, everyone. I'm just going to try and I put, put slides together for you guys. Share. There we go. So we're going to... We're going to talk about NFTs today, non-fungible tokens. First, I think let's let's go over a dictionary definition. I'm going to break it down because there is quite a there are quite a few components to what they actually are. I'm going to talk about NFT history, some some uses and applications. We're going to talk about concepts like on-chain versus off-chain NFTs. And yes, I did. I had a or actually still, you know, building NFTs on Cardano. So I had a couple of projects there, which I'm very happy to share. We're going to talk about different standards, how NFTs work on different blockchains. And then we're going to try and make an NFT live. So we will see how, we will see how that all turns out. The, here's the definition, right? And I'm, I think it's worth breaking this down into its individual, into its individual components. The first thing we want to discuss is it's a unique digital identifier, which is actually what that word non-fungible means. So there are fungible assets and non-fungible assets. If I give you a cent coin and you give me a cent coin, then nothing really has changed. We both still have a cent. And so that, that means that, you know, a New Zealand cent coin is a, is a fungible asset. So are, you know, washing tokens and so are actually cryptocurrencies in that sense. They're all fungible and interchangeable. But if you give me your driver license and I give you my driver license, then we are both, we both can't prove anymore that we are road legal. And so they are non-fungible assets. So that's what actually is meant by non-fungible. It just means that these assets are unique. There's other examples like software licenses that are very specific to a copy diplomas or um, the title to own, you know, own a house or even, you know, messages of, of appreciation, like, you know, flowers or something like that, or, you know, a, a token of a token of appreciation, I guess, you, I guess you could say with a lot of these technical terms, what happens is that they are very, they are defined very specifically and they have a very specific meaning, but when they take off, so to speak in the public arena, then they get they get a much broader definition assigned with them. That's what happened with NFTs as well. There is a strict definition what they actually mean. This definition comes from the ERC seven twenty one standard on Ethereum, and that's what the meaning A here is in the in the in the dictionary definition. But they have acquired a much wider definition as as just generally speaking the assets that are represented. To illustrate that, I put a slide there. So this here is one of my favorite NFTs. I don't know if you guys can see that move. The reason it's one of my favorite is because I won that on Twitter. They asked, what's your favorite fruit? And I said, I think I said, I like all fruit or something, including cucumber. And they liked it. So they gave me this one. And so on the left side, you see the, the first definition, the strict definition of what an NFT is. It's a digital identifier that is used to certify authenticity and ownership. So it looks a bit like computer code, which is exactly what it is. You can see there is a, I don't know if you can see my mouse. I think so. You can see a link there, which is the link to the, to the video on the right side. So the NFT itself in the strict definition is actually this digital identifier. It comes with some, you know, with some media type. It comes with a, with a name and so on and a link to the actual document, whereas 
in the wider definition, the NFT is, is also the document that is certified by it. But strictly speaking, these are two different things. Right? I need to go back to this window. Right, certify, you know, what does, what does certification mean? Basically, these things aren't new, right? You, when you have an art print here, an artist by the name of Max created in this example the, the, a colorful print of the Mona Lisa, and it comes together with a certificate on the left here. And if you look, I don't know if you can see that, but it says this is print number 400 out of a total of 700 or something like that. So you know you have an original, well, an original print from Max if you also have the, this certificate. Both of them are probably pieces of paper. Certificate of authenticity also acts as a sales receipt. It also acts as a physical document that can track do provenance of your works and so on. So that's what we're talking about, this kind of a certificate. Now, this one, I'll take a little bit, I'll take us a little bit through <clears throat> through the evolution of of different payment systems to to explain what that means. It cannot be copied, substituted or subdivided and that it is recorded on a blockchain. This is always a, a typical start, right? We have a cash system. That's what we had for a long time before the internet. In this case, Max sells his art to Alice. He physically hands over the, the, the print and the certificate and Alice pays with a dollar physically. This requires them to be close physically and it doesn't require any trusted party when you look at it, right? So there, no one else, in fact, actually knows that these guys are doing that transaction. With digital payments, that's different. So, you know, let's say Max sells it over the internet and we have a typical online shopping situation. Then um, we have the trusted party here, Jean Piermont. He's a great guy. Everyone trusts him. You know, everyone gives him all the money, and he runs a central, he runs a central ledger, which in which he enters basically this transaction here that Alice has signed. This is Alice's transaction. She says one dollar or from Alice to Max, and then Jean Piermont puts that in the ledger, and everyone trusts the system. And Max, let's say in the in the case of internet shopping, online shopping, just puts it on a truck and, and ships it to ships the both the certificate and the artwork to Alice. But this re, this system requires a trusted party. A peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system is one where <coughs> everyone has a ledger and Alice doesn't doesn't send her transaction to just one party, but she broadcasts it. So she broadcasts her transaction to everyone. Everyone puts it in the ledger. This doesn't require a central trusted party because everyone can, everyone has visibility and can control each other. So in this case, the electronic cash transfer is an entry in a decentralized ledger or in multiple copies of the ledger. And, you know, this is obviously what coin was the first example of a, of a system that actually, that actually worked and that took off in an ideal world. This would, this would be pretty straightforward, right? She broadcasts it. Everyone puts an entry in their ledger. And they can later compare and make sure that these ledgers are, but agree or but to find consensus in the real world is much more complicated because of delays in the in the communication Alice could tell one person something else than than what she tells a different person and so on she could end up double spending her money and that's the actual problem that Bitcoin solved for the first time in a decentralized way so what they do is they pick someone to be I guess a trusted party, not really trusted party, but a central party temporarily, only for a very short period in time. And this is how, how all consensus mechanisms work on blockchains. One of them gets picked and their ledger then is you, this, this, you know, party or person who's picked there has the job to build a new block. And we will just see in a second what's, what a block is, but that person builds a new block and puts all the transactions into that block. The way that Bitcoin does that is by proof of work, which means all of the participants race each other to resolving a difficult, which means it's, it's random because it's not clear. It's not predetermined who will win. Whoever wins is the new block producer. And in, on other blockchains that works in a different way on Cardano, for example, Cardano was the, was the first or the, yeah, the first blockchain to implement proof of stake. Ethereum has originally used proof of work, but moved over to a system um, that is that is more similar to what Cardano is doing in the merge. 
So I need to go back here. Right, so, so the block producer, like I said, Alice creates a transaction, signs it, and then sends it off to the network, broadcasts it, and the block producer then collects all of these transactions, that's Alice's one plus other ones, and puts them together in a block. And the block is linked up cryptographically to, to, to older blocks that were produced before. On, on Bitcoin, a block is about every 10 minutes you have a new block, that's by design. Different blockchains have different block times. Now, an NFT is basically the same as what we described before. It is that certificate is, is being broadcast now. So now we have a digital certificate. Max broadcasts that, you know, a, Mon a Mona Lisa certificate goes from Max to Alice and, and it works its way through the blockchain, through the, through the system and ends up on the blockchain. That is true for systems that use UTXO like Cardano and, and I think to a degree Bitcoin as well. For, for Ethereum, it's not strictly speaking sitting on the blockchain because Ethereum has a bit more technologically a slightly more patchy system. But the, ultimately it gets, it gets stored in multiple different places. The certificate, the, so the transfer of the art can still be physical. An NFT can be a certificate for a, for a paper piece of art, or it can be a link to, to a document that sits somewhere else, like we saw before, or it could actually sit on the blockchain. So what we see here, but the point here is that you don't need a trusted party for the certificate. It comes directly from the artist and it goes directly to the customer, if you will, and can be sold on. So this is here what I meant. About 10% of NFTs, I saw some numbers recently, 10% of all NFTs across NFTs across all blockchains are so-called on-chain NFTs. And this is where the artwork itself is broadcast and also stored on the blockchain. This one, you don't need any central party and you can completely, you know, by yourself or maybe in a team or whatever, produce these things, sell them, everything just from, from, from your home. Obviously, art is not the only use case, but you know this is what this was the was the big one. So you don't you also don't need a shipment, and you don't need a server because it's all on the blockchain. Just to illustrate that a little bit better, you have an on-chain bunny here. You can see that that's quite pixelated, and you can have an off-chain bunny, which is a, a nice photo of an actual of an actual bunny. The difference I'm making here is that well, first what I said is that right if you own an on-chain bunny, or if you create one, you actually own that transaction output, or you own the actual bunny on the blockchain. However, if you own a blockchain bunny, and again, that's 90% of all NFTs, what you own is a link to a file that sits somewhere else, right? Or I shouldn't say own, what you what you have in your wallet is, is a link to a file that sits somewhere else. Now, of those 90% of NFTs out there, about 50% 50 50 in total are sitting on some servers. That could just be some centralized servers like Google, you know, Google Drive or something like this. And so these links could break in theory. About 40% sit on IPFS. That's the one that I showed you guys before. I think you saw that link to the grapes was an IPFS link, which is a decentralized store and which is immutable. So the link can't change. And it's kind of in a way a more, more secure way of, of linking them up. That's one aspect that the, that the actual thing is on the chain. The other aspect of what comes with that is a limitation in size. And this is why this on-chain bunny is so pixelated because the blockchain is not actually made for, you know, storing lots of data on it. On the Cardano blockchain, there's a 16 kilobyte size limitation. So if you do the, the numbers, then that means if you do a pixel image, you can do 73 by 73 pixels, pixels roughly at 24 bit color depth. So it's not, there's not a, a lot, a lot of space, and I guess that's what partially makes it also interesting and exciting as a medium for for digital art. So there we go. Blockchain. These things can't be copied, can't be copied, substituted, or subdivided. That relates to you know within that blockchain, within that system, it can't be copied. So yeah, I said ownership before. I don't really want to talk about. I'm not a you know, a, a lawyer, I don't really understand what authenticity and ownership, how that's defined, but I do want to tell a little story about that because there was an interesting case that goes over, over, over several years, almost a decade. And that involves the, the first NFT, the media call it the first NFT. 
And that story starts in 2014 in, in a hackathon in New York, seven on seven. And this hackathon, I think, happens every year. And an artist, Kevin McCoy, was paired in that hackathon with a technologist, Anil Desh. And these guys worked together on a, they figured out that, you know, digital art is worthless at the time. Because if you're a digital artist and you want to show someone your art, you send it, let's say you send a JPEG file that you made via email, you've already given it away. There is, it is, it, there was no way to, to certify an original digital file at the time. Also, the second problem they saw was that Bitcoin, which at the time Bitcoin had fallen off a cliff for the first time and everyone was fleeing Bitcoin, right? In, in 2014, mid 2014, people thought, you know, this isn't going to go anywhere. <laughs> and so it was, it was a, I guess the first big bear market, which is kind of similar maybe to a situation that we're in at the moment. Well, so they then figured out that these things could be combined. I want to, I want to play that video for you guys just to get an idea of what that was like. It's just one minute. And well, the goal here was to bring together these two communities that have issues that they need to resolve. In the case of the artists, strengthening the values of their works. And in the case of the Bitcoin community, find something to do besides, <laughs> with their lives. Besides overthrow the Federal Reserve. Right, right. So it's good to have Venn diagrams. This is the way we think about the communities. There are the current set of people that are literate about blockchains. It's a current set of people that are not entirely contemptuous, all artistic endeavor in society. And then current people in this room are in this very sliver of overlap. And you know what that smells like? A market. Yes. <laughs> so we want to make the overlap slightly larger between these sets. Here's the cool thing. We built it. Yeah, so obviously I think you can tell from the from the mood in there how, you know, how new that felt and how fresh the idea was at the time. And and they built it. They part of the story is also an important part of the story is that they built it on a on a blockchain that was a fork on a on a Bitcoin fork, which was called Namecoin. And Namecoin was originally made to 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 register internet addresses, right? Domain names like Google.com and so on. You could on that and it still exists, I think. And you can you can register a domain on it and you have to renew it every I think 250 days or so. Later in that same session, a lady shouts something that I can't quite hear, but it leads to the first and transaction. The goal here was to bring together where's that next one? It leads to the first the first transaction of, of a of an NFT. And we're just gonna Watch that briefly too. That is really good, right? You know, that's an excellent question. Hey, uh, are you interested in some animated GIF art? Am I ever? I got a good. I got a. I got a cool thing here. Check this out. Hey, do you want to want to buy that? Yeah, name your price in any currency. Twenty bucks. Twenty bucks sounds fair. You, you got twenty bucks? I probably do. Twenty bucks. To pay you in U.S. dollars? Sure. All right. That's cool with me. I have four dollars. <laughs> Jesus. Really? Minor of bargaining people, friend. That's. The <laughs> <laughs> That's the sorry state of my art market, yeah, right there in a nutshell, know. folks. Jesus. Four dollars, um, and so then nothing happens for years, right, Kevin? Basically, what you saw there was the the second ever NFT being sold for four dollars. I'm struggling a little bit with. Here we go. However, a few years later, in June 2021, they go on to they never they never actually renewed the original NFT. But what they did is they created a new NFT on the Ethereum blockchain, because by that time that's where that's where NFTs were, you know. That's that's where where almost all the NFTs were. So the quantum, which is the first NFT, I suspect it was their test token. The artwork here, that green thing, is actually was made by Kevin McCoy's wife, and that one sold for one point four million dollars. And they didn't renew they didn't renew the original NFT of this one here, but somebody else did. 
they on the day or day after uh, after this was sold on Sotheby's or after it was advertised or something like that, when the news came out, somebody went into the original blockchain and renewed the original NFT and then claimed that they are the rightful owners of the of the NFT and sued Kevin McCoy and Sotheby's. And by the time I put these these slides together for the first time, this was the you know this case was still going. But a few months from now, before now, it was the yeah, end of March, the case got dismissed, right? Which is kind of, I guess, now the end of the story. It's really, I think, one of the interesting things here, and they say it in the title too, code is not law, right? Just because you have an NFT on a blockchain, that doesn't really mean that that you, yeah, just because you possess that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can, that you can prove that you, that you own an underlying asset or something like this. I think there's probably more to come from that, but the decision of the of the judges in this case to go with the artists who actually created the work, I think uh, personally I find that encouraging. So I don't know if that's if that's too small to read, but my main point here with the timeline is that it's always difficult to say. You know, media say this is the first NFT and the first of of anything, but in terms of technology, there is always a first of a certain kind, but very often the ideas were there long before so in this case you know in the if, if you want a timeline of nfts for example the, to use a chain of blocks or a blockchain that's an that's an older idea that that was you know published in 1991 in the early 90s by Haber and stonetta and it was a you know tamper-proof document time stamping system even the the idea of smart contracts is you know it stems from the mid 90s also, digital collectibles, the idea to have these, to have something like NFTs also stems, maybe the earliest one I could see stems from the mid 90s. The idea to have a decentralized cash system is about 10 years older than Bitcoin. And obviously, if you look at the, if you look at the Bitcoin white paper, cites all of these other ones, right? So that wasn't the, they didn't really invent when Bitcoin was invented. They didn't really invent all of these individual bits and pieces, but what they invented was a way to combine them. And this is always a, a story, and this is probably also similar here with what we just looked at with Kevin McCoy and Anil Desh. The idea was in the air, and these guys went with that. And obviously, at the time when when the NFT craze happened here in 2021, that's when Kevin McCoy, you know, remembered his his early NFT, and he then kind of re rebranded it, I guess, as an NFT because it wasn't an NFT at the time. And you know, the story went from there. The, the term NFT actually stems from the when NFTs go mainstream from the, like I said, ERC 721 standard in 2017. So, you know, what's the first NFT depends on how you use that term. But I just find it generally interesting to, to look at the history of things if you want to know what they are, to put that a little bit in context. So we talked about what they are and let's let's think about what, what they could be, right? What could NFTs actually be? Be used for. We hear a lot about proof of work, proof of ownership, proof of authenticity. So I thought I do an analysis of of proof types, right? So my my good friend Chat GPT and I came up with a really long list of all sorts of proof types, and we try to categorize it. And I think this one was an interesting categorization, which is why I put it in here, because it shows a few things that I that I find somewhat insightful. So. First of all, there, there's a, you might want to prove something using NFTs or using the blockchain technology. You might want to prove something to the world, right? You might want to prove that publicly, like the ownership of, I don't know, of an, of an art NFT, let's say. But there are other things that you might not want to prove publicly, like membership in certain clubs or subscription to certain services and things like that. You may not want to prove that to the, to the world. The same thing is true for, you know, you might, you might want to prove conservation efforts publicly, but you may not want to prove medical records publicly, right? So that's, that's one interesting aspect, I think, of what the technology can be used for. Currently, most blockchains, at least the popular ones, are all public blockchains. This is why I think the use cases that we are seeing at the moment are mostly these kind of public proofs. They are proofs of what people, you know, um, that you get that for free basically with the technology already whereas private proofs requires an extra effort there are no standards for that there are some privacy chains 
but this this hasn't fully worked out yet. So it explains to me at least in in part which kinds of applications are already out there and 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 why, right? It it shows that. Another aspect to that is you can have a a category of intrinsic proof, which in this case means that that you don't need any other party to prove something, right? Let's say ownership of an NFT. Well, the certificate proves that directly. You don't need any central party to issue anything, right? If you own the if you own the the NFT in your wallet, then you know you can prove that that's your wallet. Whereas if you have something like provenance, we talk about provenance quite a bit, right? Yes, you can have these NFTs, but somebody has to load them with meaning. There has to be some party off off chain outside of the blockchain that kind of gives meaning to these. It could be that that's a, a trusted party that issues those tokens. And then, you know, that, you know, this is typically done with identity verification, proof of identity, is something that in this group, in the, in the Web3 and Z we have talked about, or I have talked about with, a, with a few people. And I know it's something proof of identity that, that, that we need resolved. And I suspect that, you know, we can debate if it is, if it is classified correctly here under extrinsic or intrinsic, I think efforts are there to create solutions that, that make it intrinsic to the technology, but those those are not not yet readily available. So, yeah, I think that's kind of an kind of an interesting way of of looking at applications. So, before I talk about the the projects that I made and show you guys some some nice pictures, I just want to quickly because also there was a there was one question before why why Cardano right and what's the difference here? For me, as a as somebody who is interested mostly in the technology behind you know behind the the things one thing that strikes me is that almost all nfts are are made are implemented in in this way following ethereum standards at the moment right ethereum was was started or designed i guess first in 2014 which was before that idea had taken off and ethereum had ethereum brought this this great utility of programmable of of you know, of, of being able to program your transactions um, with smart contracts. And this is how NFTs work on Ethereum. They are a smart contract. So everything to do with your token, and I just put that here for comparison, right? I'm obviously not going to go into the detail here, but if you look at this graphic here of the of the ERC20 standard, which is for fungible tokens, right? Think cryptocurrencies, let's say, other currencies, and this this standard for non-fungible tokens, you can see that the NFT standard is somewhat derived from the standard for, for, for cryptocurrencies, right? So basically, when you develop an NFT, you write a computer program in the Solidity language, which is, a, which is the smart contract language in Ethereum. And most blockchains have, have copied that. Not most blockchains, that's wrong. Most, most NFTs are on blockchains that have copied this. On Cardano, it's different. Cardano was designed later, and with the benefit of hindsight, they basically have a multi-asset ledger, which means that you don't just have one cryptocurrency that is very different from all the other ones on the same network, but all of the cryptocurrencies on the Cardano network are have a minting policy, like you know this thing here, which can be a smart contract or not, but it's basically just it defines you know for you have one of these per currency or per NFT collection, let's say. And it defines who can mint tokens in terms of the addresses, who can who can mint one for this co collection, when can the tokens be minted, how many tokens can be minted, and so on. This is a split off from the actual data of the NFT on Cardano, where I showed you before the, the metadata, the transaction metadata, that, that code that I showed you guys was basically this thing here. There's a thumbnail, there's a file and a link, and it links up to its policy ID. So you don't need a smart contract. The way it works on Cardano is that this, you see down here, I wrote NFT and policy name and so on. Basically, the, the transaction metadata, that second, that second blue file, that, or that, yeah, that second blue box that I showed you before, that content goes inside of a transaction. So if I create an NFT on Cardano, what that means is I come up with the metadata here, I put that inside the transaction, and I sign it with my policy signature. And I sign it with my wallet signature, and then I broadcast it. So that's the that's the transaction that gets broadcast, and then the block producer, like we said before, puts it 
in a block on the blockchain. I have a summary here of, of differences between Ethereum and Cardano. I guess in summary, you can say that the way that Ethereum does NFTs is far more widespread, which you can, you know, you can look at things like CryptoSlam and see how many NFTs are traded there. It's far more widespread. And other blockchains like Tron, Binance, Smart Chain, which is currently in the news, Polygon and so on, they have all copied, they have all copied the standard, right? So for Binance, it's the, instead of, instead of ERC 721, it's the BEP 721 standard, right? So yeah, I guess in summary, you can say that the way it's done in Cardano is a more robust system. We can discuss this if you want, but I don't want to go too much into detail here either. And this is something that I, that I prefer because I'm a, I'm a nerd, right? So I like, I like nerdy things and I like robust design over, over adoption, over short term adoption necessarily. Yeah. So that was, that was pretty much that from now on, it's more, it's more about talking about collections and art and that sort of stuff. That's fine. I don't know if there are any, any questions or comments now, or if we should just, uh, just rock on Kelly. Because it could be nice to not, to not have me just continuously talk. <laughs> yeah. The room's always on open for questions. questions. I don't have anything in the chat at the moment. Oh, Bettina. Hi. Yeah, she said hello. Um, hello. Yeah. If anyone has any questions, um, feel free to jump in now. Otherwise, we can just kick on. Cool. Yeah. So, you know, people collect all sorts of things. I might just put some examples there, rubber duckies or Monopoly games and so on. And the collections market is, I think a year ago, I saw these numbers. So I don't know where it's at now, but... It was about $600 billion, which is the same size as the accountancy service market at that time. And it, it, is, it was projected to, to roughly double the collectibles market to about a, a, a trillion dollars, which would be about the same size as the, as the biotech market, right? And most of that, most of that, you know, extra the market volume was was attributed to nfts so expect over the next 10 years right so people are expecting that collectibles will be i guess the whole collectibles market will be made up to by, you know 50 percent or so of nfts which is which is quite interesting the standard nfts you know that what you have seen is like you know pictures of monkeys or of bananas eating bananas or whatever it is right which i think um you know it's art and it is art that caters to the taste of a of a specific audience not necessarily to my taste but you know i, I like some of those <laughs> and what you know these these things you know it might seem it might seem silly you know if you're not if you're not into you know a, i don't know a, a pixelated picture of a of a poop or something like that then that might seem that might seem silly but at the same time there are people that are into that and they have pocket money and they buy that and you know they go out in the market and do do a lot of do a lot of things there. So the kind of stuff I am more into looks a bit more like that. Again, I'm a nerd, right? So I like ge geometric art, and I do like art that has an emotional impact on me. I don't, I can't necessarily see that here with with these ones here, but they are technically interesting. The the autoglyphs, they were they are attributed to be the first on chain NFTs, and they were of course on the Ethereum network. And I just copied this one in here from the from the block explorer. It you can't really see it, but maybe you can see the pattern there. This is actually the code. This is the smart contract code. In other words, the graph the graphics that you see up there are they are not this is not a picture on the blockchain, but this is a smart contract that that prints out all of these all of these symbols. Over here we have a now um a few years after because this all I got into that in 2021 right and on Cardano I was relatively early so it was about half a year in after Cardano got NFTs and there were a couple of on-chain NFTs when I started now there is quite a quite a list of them so yeah I had two projects I'll just quickly go over them and show them the first one is really silly and the second one is was a collaboration with an artist in in York in England who who found me via my via my silly NFTs? So I had this yeah I had this idea of of the wicked kiwis, 
which was I was playing in in 2018 or so. I was playing with anagrams for for the for Wicked Capsi, which is basically a Wicked Capsi is just a a nickname that I made up, and I played with anagrams for that, and then I started drawing these little images. And I thought when I started to, you know, for me, this was a project to actually get involved with the technology and figure out how to do things. So I thought, oh, yeah, this idea will do. So I created these cards that flip around. And, you know, they, this is all code, what you see here. This is code that runs on the blockchain. It's not actually graphics. Of course, the, yeah, I don't know. I can talk about that a little bit later, but if you want to. But basically, I had no idea that you were supposed to do 10,000 NFTs. So I just came up with 12 motifs times 12 themes, which is the different colors, right? Times 12 cards. I didn't consider rarities at the time because I, I had no idea about NFTs. This was all a, a technical, I guess, endeavor. They are interactive. So if you click on them, they flip around and they are on chain. This is just another another view that is kind of similar to what I showed you with the grapes before. So basically I wrote this here and I wrote the, the stuff that is that is in here, which is HTML code. So these NFTs are basically little web pages, right? It's HTML with JavaScript. That's what they actually really are. And they sit on inside of this transaction metadata. So I tweeted them, of course, you know. <laughs> I tweeted individual cards and I, I made giveaways, you know, came up with some ideas to try and get some people engaged, mainly with the goal to connect and, and to learn more. I did a naming contest and I showed them to colleagues in real life. Some of my colleagues actually got kind of like these and we are currently working on a kid's book that is based on Wilbur. Wilbur is the name that Wilbur is the Uber Kiwi, right? And he fights fear. And Wilbur is, Wilbur is the name that came out of that naming contest. So what I got, the responses that I got on Twitter were, you know, for giveaways, you get thank you tweets, and that creates a little bit, got some followers, not not a lot, a few hundred followers now. New new connections, which that's that's the was the main interesting thing for me, I guess. I also learned that, I put that here in Ola Crypto and Elxi. I learned that you, <laughs> which I, you know, I guess as an adult, you maybe you should you should know that beforehand, but I, I didn't. I learned that if somebody comes on Twitter, approaches you and says, Hey, look, I got 300,000 followers, give me money, I will, I will send, <laughs> I will, I will, you know, do a, a giveaway, you can run a giveaway through me. This is actually how it is done. And these guys did, I gave them money, they did run giveaways. But I then ended up sitting, sitting there for I think, two days in a row, just deleting these Twitter bot followers that I had acquired. Yeah, something to some, I don't know, a learning, I guess. Wilbur says no to fear. I already said that there might be a kid's book coming out. So anyway, this guy here, this guy's Jay, or his actual name is Jason Steele. He calls himself Uber Boring Man on Twitter, and he calls himself Super Boring Man on Instagram. And he used to work for, for this guy here, for Eli Saab, which I had no idea because I don't know, you know, international fashion or anything like that. But apparently Eli Saab is somebody who makes dresses like like this one. And Jay was his worked for him for seven years as an arts director. He also worked as a uni professor. That I think that's more in his role there as a uni professor with, with his students in the Lebanese American University, and he defined an arts degree there. He's also an artist. I think this bear is from him. And also he already had some NFT projects going. And he already sold some NFTs by the time when he contacted me. So I was obviously very excited that, you know, somebody who's, who's already done some NFTs wants to collaborate with me. And yeah, he's also, a, he's also an, an, an excellent guy. He's really nice and great to work with. So I learned, you know, I, this is a different, like I said, you know, I said it before about art, you know, it's, it's about taste, but I think it's also when you take it seriously and he's an academic guy, right? It's about beauty. It's about emotional power. It's about meaning. Um, and and the impact it, it has on you, right? And the other thing I just wanted to say about interactive art is that you want to interact with the piece of art in the way that it's intended. So, you know, I guess if you if I put the original Mona Lisa somewhere here on my beams or something like that, I guess that might just not, you know, it might not have the, the, the right effect. But if you have interactive art, um, the one that we made, his concept, basically, that he his idea that he showed me then, 
was meant to be in a in a situation like these ones here, right, where you have it in a museum on a big wall and you can interact with it. This art is typically not collectible, right? You typically don't have people collect like museum pieces like this. However, ours is. So he said the very first picture he sent me was this left one there. And I thought, okay, is that a cloud of things? And that's a finger. And so obviously we had, I never talked to him to this day. I've never talked with him, but we, we managed to, to make a NFT collection of thousand NFTs and sell them out. And that was quite a, quite a process. It took a long time to sell them too, because that's also not for everyone, I guess. Um, but he, yeah, he's a, he's a very creative guy. We, we had to learn how to work together because I have never, I've worked as a software developer and I have worked in situations where the software has specific, you know, I've also worked as a researcher. I've also come up with, you know, specific, whatever it is, you know, the ideas of how exactly the software is supposed to work and things like that. You need that if you want to develop software. However, this guy has never worked with a software developer and he just, you know, I don't know how to say radiates creativity, right? He has concepts, he understands concepts and all that. He's an academic after all, but the way that he works was we had to find a way of how to work together, which is really interesting. I think that would have never, I would have never run into that guy if it wasn't for, if it wasn't for the, you know, for blockchain and, and things like that. So we had as a starting point, the process was uh, the starting point was uh, the concept that he had and his artistic references which I learned is that artists also have references. They reference other art and they reference other, you know, real other, other situations from life and all sorts of things. And then the refinement was basically this collaboration process. I think much of the things it took, it took a while for me to buy into the art in the beginning because I couldn't see it. The kind of words that he used to describe it, it didn't make much sense for me. And I just ended up trying to, trying to make these animations that he said, but Obviously, there were misunderstandings and things, and I think that is kind of what added to it. And once we were finished, he said that this is something that he couldn't have done by himself, even the art aspects of it. And, you know, it doesn't look like one of his pieces. It, it, and I said, well, it certainly doesn't look like what I could have done. So I think it's a, yeah, it's a collaboration that, that we did. And he said that, I, I said, okay, we need to test this on different devices. And he said he doesn't have different devices. He had an iPhone and an iPad. So he did all of that on an iPad and I needed to write more software, not just the NFT itself, but I needed to write an editor for him. This one here so that he could, you know, change the colors and the speed of the, of the objects that, that fly around and, and all sorts of things. Yeah. I tried to get him to test it on other devices, but he said he does also doesn't know anyone who has, who has a device other than an iPad or an iPhone. So yeah, it was a really interesting experience. Um, I don't know, I put there exploration, exhaustion, meditation. Yeah, there you go. So I had learnings, uh, I had technical learnings, if you know, could also be discussed if someone's interested about on-chain NFTs, the kind of design principles and constraints and things like that, that you come up with. There's interesting things with, with licenses, I guess, and how you, I don't know how you deal with that or how we dealt with it. But I want to show you guys the result here real quick. So if you put one finger down, then they come. And if you put two fingers down, they, they go away from you, which is what, what she's playing here with. Like I said, this is actually meant, it works on small devices, but it's, it's meant to be projected onto a wall. There's a cycle in there. So now they leave and the cycle will start again. There's a little, the screen goes dark and then the screen goes bright again. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So there is quite a lot of variety in the thousand NFTs that we did. Here is a, a new word I learned, a triptych of, I, I hope that's how it's pronounced, of, of three different, of three, of three times the same NFT. So like I said, when a cycle, when it cycles back, it comes up with different objects. You can see there are fighter jets here. This one is zeros and ones in the middle, and there's more fighter jets. And this work here is called Walter Three, which is named after, after Jay's dog, who actually died since then, unfortunately. But one thing that this here also shows is that's how he had imagined it to, to, you know, to be presented maybe. 
but it's also the actually the idea to put three of them next to each other came from a community member in this case the bookie so this is really a collector's market right this is not a so these people are these people create the market there's people out there who you know who are interested in nfts and in kind of art and things like that and then they they do a lot of the work to to actually popularize it or to find other collectors and things like that this is another NFT. This one's called Reactive Stripe D. We did one for we did a we did one called Primashenko, which is this one here, as a as a charity token. That's the only one that is actually still that can still be minted. We don't get any money from that one. No one does. Also, the minter we pay, we we have a we we teamed up with a minter because we didn't want to do for my first NFTs. I did the minting myself, all on Linux command line stuff. But for this one, it was much more convenient to just give a little bit of the profits to someone else to, to, to look after that. Yeah, it's, it's based on Maria Primashenko, who is a Ukrainian folk artist. Then, yeah, this one, I don't know. It's, you know, I, I, the rest here is really just pictures that I could show you guys. And, you know, we, we can talk about that. The wrong fairy tale. That's, yeah, that's a weird mix of Disney, Walt Disney colors with military camouflage and fighter jets and things like that. So yeah, so this one we put on a we put on a on a market. This is a little bit older. That looks a little bit different now. For NFT market, we I made I made a technical tweet series also to try and you know get it out there. This tweet here was quite interesting because I got some responses from people in, in the Cardano community who who liked the way that I did the technical encoding, and these are all I think because it saves space. So at the time I said I told you it was half an hour, half a half a year in from Cardano NFTs, and it was maybe two other people had done on-chain NFTs before, but I changed the encoding from what they had done because I thought I could save more space. And after that, yeah, this and um, you know people have have considered some of the stuff I did to put into standards, and you know we had some some nice discussions. Yeah, this is it pretty much. So. Yeah, I think I, maybe I might have spoken a little bit more than 45 minutes. But this is pretty much all I wanted to tell. So we can have a chat if you want, or we can we can also make a, make an NFT live if we want to. That was amazing. I didn't know you had so many personal projects going on. The children's book. Very cool. What we might do is we just I might just share the screen quickly. And if we could just fill out sort of the survey for the feedback and then we'll jump straight into questions or open up the room to chat, if that's okay so it's just a let me see if i can try and make that a bit bigger so i might just leave that up for a couple of minutes or one minute and then we'll come back to you gregor okay hopefully everyone's grabbed the screen by now Cool. And we do have a couple of questions in the chat box, so I might just read them out to you and then we can, if everyone wants to open up and put their camera on, we can have a chat instead. But the first couple of questions was back to one of your Kiwi, I think it was the Kiwi, I forget the name of it, Wilbur? Was it right, Wilbur. Wilbur, yeah, yeah. Was there a specific reason for the 10,000 number or is it arbitrary? Yes. So that's historic, right? I, I said I said that I didn't know that you were supposed to to do a, which is a little bit cheeky to say it that way. You, you can do what you want. Like your collection can be, it's an arbitrary number. But the CryptoPunks, which were, you know, very famous and, and now very expensive collection of profile pictures, I think they started it on Ethereum. They started a collection of 10,000 of those NFTs. People have done other numbers. Mm -hmm. And so... I think if you enter, if you go into a market that, let's put it that way, I think the fact that this, this collection, apart from the fact that I never meant to sell it, right? And I haven't sold a single one. I've just given them away, but we sold it at the next project. But apart from that, I could have, I probably also couldn't have sold it that easily. And one factor would have been that I didn't do 10,000 because that's what they were expecting out there, right? Every, and that hype year in 2021, every that's what everyone did. Everyone tried to copy that success model of, of CryptoPunks. I don't know. I guess does that give a bit of... Yeah, so it's more the perception rather than a rule. 
Cool. Yeah. And the other question was, so as a UX designer, what factors do we need to consider to communicate and collaborate specifically Web3 and blockchain developers? Wow, that's a really interesting question. So I'm not a UX designer. I am, I am not a designer. I've designed systems, not from a UX perspective. Maybe a question to yeah, maybe a question to open up for, you know, if some if somebody else wants to say something about that. What so yeah, or maybe maybe if I get a bit more context I can maybe say something. Or what would you say for what were your learnings when you were minting and creating this NFT piece mm -hmm. with that artist? What were the main yeah learnings that you would give advice so i mean okay so specifically with that artist and i think it might just be in the question there was already it said clear communication right what you can do and can't, what what is possible and not possible is something that i it took me a little while to to figure to figure him out specifically and to see that he was constantly changing stuff i was you know it cost me a lot of time and right. a lot of energy um, to to, so I could have approached it more in the retrospective. I could have approached it a little bit more professionally in the way that I used to when I was, you know, developing software. But the situation was different because we were partners and not, I wasn't, you know, he wasn't paying me. We were just doing this together and see if we could sell it or something like that. So showing like, you know, all the, all the good stuff, you know, do, do small iterations, you know, and show, you know, be agile and, and, and show, I don't know, show, show frequent updates and things like that. It kind of keeps you from, from going off too much, too much off track. Yeah. I'm not sure I can say anything, anything more substantial about that specifically with, with working with him. So just to give you some context, cause I was the one that asked that question. Mm -hmm. So I am a UX designer and I'm really familiar with working with Web2 developers who do like apps and sites and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I guess my kind of like question is kind of like, because I imagine that, you know, how developers in Cardano kind of like develop in Haskell and things like that. And I'm not <coughs> sure if Marlos like, you know, friendly for the everyday person yet, but like, what technical, how can we, like, what considerations and things that we should think about to, to make it easier for the developers' technical considerations? So, oh, yeah, okay, I see. So I think the choice of the choice of technology, you know, or the choice of what exact, um, the way that I used to do that when I was a software developer mainly was I, I pretty much, you know, had, I pretty much insisted in, in choosing the technology myself. Like, am I, is this, is this a Haskell project or is this, should this be done in Marlowe? Like you say, right. There's just, if you use these two specific ones, right. In on Cardano, if you use these two specific programming languages, Marlowe is relatively new, only came out, I think quite recently and is intended for people who are not, not programmers. That's how they say it. Right. It's not a Turing complete programming language. So you cannot program just anything in Marlowe but you can program financial contracts and these sorts of things. It's made for, for decentralized finance. And so you would probably pick that language, you know, under certain circumstances for certain things, and you cannot do anything in Marlowe. Then Plutus is actually the smart contract language on Cardano that is based on Haskell, like you say. And yeah, it's functional programming. It's, it is unusual for most programmers to think in that way. People find it tricky, but I think it's just different. That said, I don't personally have much experience. I've played with Haskell a little bit, but I've never, I've never done anything with Plutus. The other thing that is actually now changing is really the way that that the software gets written, right? I have, so that was still before ChatGPT, right? That was still before tools that that actually allow you to just ask for code and you get code. And then you can, you know, can change it. I think these things will change a lot in the way that that software gets developed. So I think, yeah, clear communication, right? If you talk to them what you need and what you need things to look like and all that sort of stuff, I think that's always going to help, right? Cool. Thank you. Awesome, Jake. Yeah. Hey, Gregor. 
just going to ask what you're up to on this space at the moment, actually. Uh, we do quite a bit in the Cardano NFT space, and I just looked at oh, your cool. project on JPEG, and it, the stats are pretty good, so I'm just curious to know what you're doing these days. Yeah, so basically two, two well, maybe three things. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing three things, and I'm not actively doing any of these because it's a hobby thing and you know it's I had to do pay my crypto taxes and that took me a few weeks to figure out and all that so but once I get into it again which will hopefully be soon and one of them is a guy called so it's all on chain right what what I'm what I'm still kind of looking at I'm open to do you know whatever really I'm, I'm interested in in collaborating and in working and in learning new things and that sort of stuff but the current things I have is one one is a on-chain idea a pretty simple one that I first, first kind of almost dismissed as too simple, but then, you know, I still don't get this art thing. So, you know, I should probably, I think simple is good, I reckon. I had a chat with a guy from from Dead Space who is in Wales, I think. And yeah, so he had this idea. And so I might do I might do that with him. It's kind of a, it's kind of nerdy too. So that might be, a, it's, it's a combination of different colored dots and things like that. So that could be kind of cool. The other one is that with Steel, with this guy, Jay, we we actually have planned a another collection that that follows that one which yeah we got a little bit so he's he's not not very healthy at the moment and so you know this didn't really go anywhere and yeah i have regular meetings with my colleagues in callahan innovation with some of them where we discuss how to how to make that kids book so i think that one will probably be the most likely one to to come out at some point where where we'll we will have one nfts one chapter and it's all on chain and there will be some graphics and we already have the text it's a it's a pretty cute book yeah cool oh no it's good to know i just tried to go into your discord but it said the link yeah. wasn't valid so i was just curious to hear yeah cool so what are, what's the kind of stuff you are doing you guys are doing on with we've just got a project jet plane i've seen that yeah yeah so cool. we're minting a few at the moment actually but we're yeah we're just kind of in a few different directions at the moment with it but essentially we're helping projects do their minting as well as just opening up a few tools to make minting more accessible for other people and so forth our website's jetplanenft.com but yeah always interested to find people in cardano nfts and always looking to collaborate because there's only a few of us but there's definitely mm. enough around to form a bit of a community around cool so can you guys do if if i just have json files for metadata and stuff can you can you mint that too does it have to be you know does it have to be an image and or can it be on chain let's say yeah yeah no we do all that so we've just opened up essentially our own minting service i'm more the operational side of things whereas my co-founder on the project he's done all the minting he's got he's built his own minting engine for yeah our project which we can let other projects use now which is really good but yeah we had over 100 traits that we needed to compile and like mm -hmm. update metadata as we it's quite complex i might have to yeah i'll let you go through the process to have a look but it's yeah it's quite cool the minting engine that he's built out yeah excellent so maybe you know maybe instead of showing that that free minting service that i was just going to show for one nft maybe we could just change that you can you know you can show us how how that works oh. with your services but but that yeah, might also be a <laughs> like, session on, on another day as well yeah yeah but we'll stay in touch anyway and we can discuss that yeah yeah awesome yeah we'd be definitely keen to see a demo or an, yeah. um was there any other questions before we wrap things up? James asked, what do you think about Bitcoin or Did you get that, Greg? No, sorry. I'm I'm a little bit confused at the moment. <laughs> what What's the, the question was from James, what do you think about Bitcoin ordinals? Oh, ordinals. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear sorry. that. It's not um, my my voice. Yeah, cool. So I don't know much about ordinals. I think they are the way they are done is basically similar to the similar to this idea of colored coins in 2012 from from Rosen, and they are they are attached to an individual Satoshi technically, so to the smallest. So in a way, I guess you could say they're an afterthought, which isn't surprising because NFTs weren't weren't there when when Bitcoin was first, and you know that wasn't really a a main concern of the design of Bitcoin. They had a yeah, they had a taproot update and and that allowed later to, I guess, 
to have to have these ordinals on the blockchain. I think I would restrict my 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 view on to that because I haven't played with them. I have no idea what's on there. I have just seen that they have picked up quite a bit and that they have produced quite a bit of traffic for the Bitcoin blockchain that I think people were maybe in part also struggling with. <clears throat> yeah, I guess that's that's probably. Awesome. Thank you. Any more, any last questions before we wrap up? Katina? Um, yeah, I just have a question. You just called Gregor or Jake? Because I work with a collective of artists. So we're an artistic collective. Mm. So we come more from the artwork side of things. And mm. so when we meant this, because one of our artists were actually asked if they can start creating real piece. And I just want to make, uh, like, I just want to check, like, when we mint them, do we have to kind of like, you know, teach them which specific wallets they should be using if they're not familiar with the blockchain? And if like the smart contracts are safe and how do we go about checking the smart contracts? Mm. Yeah, so, so I don't have much experience with, with smart contract NFTs, which is like I said, that's how they, how they are done on Ethereum. There, yeah, sorry. Um, like I said, for me, the the my own experience was mostly in in Cardano. You would you would probably for for checking the smart contracts and things. I understand there are people who provide smart contract auditing. You might want to find them if it's you know if that's worth it. I I don't sorry I don't really know in terms of which wallets to use. That's there are you know the po there are popular wallets that that's true for you know for any blockchain. They're cross blockchain wallets and things it's i guess picking a wallet that is that is safe and that is what i generally what i do is i look at you know which ones are the popular ones and i look a little bit at you know at, at people's reviews and things like that and then then i pick that wallet or you know i hear from someone in the community that i trust but i always i think it's always important to do a bit of research on that one then you know when you're confident in in which wallet you would use then then I guess, I don't know if it's a matter of teaching or of recommending other wallets, but it shouldn't really matter that much. For NFTs, there might be some, I know for Cardano, there are some, some wallets that work better for NFTs because they can also show the content in the wallet and things like that. But you can use, yeah, a, a large variety of wallets should work. Cool, thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say, it depends what you want to do with it, really. Like, like... Yeah, it depends how complex you want to get, what you're looking to achieve. I mean, it's just for your own membership or your own collective of artists to hold as verification of something. It doesn't need to be overly complex at all. But if you're looking to raise $100,000 as a way of kickstarting something from a mass audience, that's where you need to get a bit more complex and clever with your marketing, your NFTs, the rarities as... Greg has already explained. So it just depends on the use case you're really looking for and having a plan for that because it's just like anything, the more you're looking to raise, the more complex you kind of have to make it. Okay, but yeah, that's good to know because I think we're wanting to really do this properly from like a commercial level, you know, like because it's not, our focus is not so much kind of like, you know, creating the NFTs, but for example, for now, like if our clients commissioned us to do artwork, it would be great if we can kind of like NFT and then the smart contract will have the licensing and stuff. So, you know, like actually really utilize the power of the blockchain as opposed to the NFT campaign. Right. So you want to use it more as a contract as verification. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so for oh, example, if we want to renew it for another campaign, then it'll automatically like the NFT will kind of know that it's being used again and they wouldn't need to come back to us to relicense, for example. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that doesn't need to be overly complex if it's used as a verification as such. But yeah. 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 It just becomes part of the process. I, I'm just trying to figure out the best way that you'd go about implementing that. But I don't. There are quite a few are tools out there. Tools. None are really coming to mind at the moment, but there are ways to be able to do that quite simply. Yeah, cool. No, that's really good to know. Thank you. 
Yeah. Yeah. Also, I mean, you know, good, good on you for for you know bringing these things up, and and thanks, Jake, for for chipping in. I, 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 I'm wondering, you know, that might be a question for maybe you know some other some other people in the in the Web three NZ community as well. <laughs> Yeah, Bettina Miller might be good for you to connect with, which I can send you a message on Circle after this. She's done something, I think it might be similar with logos. Yeah, I'll send you her details and it might be good for you two to connect. Yeah, that would be really good because I've been researching the space for about two years now and this is the first time I'm engaging with the community. So, yeah. Awesome. Great to have you. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, Jake, for tuning in. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Gregor, for your amazing presentation. Thanks. Yeah, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. See you.